here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of the band The Crazies, because I spoke to one of the members very recently to find out more about life, love, poetry. It was the one and only Adrian James, the drummer of the band. And uh, this was a... Well, mainly because um, Optic Nerve Records, all the way from Preston, has released, or is about to release, an album called A Simple Vision uh, that's come out on vinyl and probably is available on Bandcamp. This was a recording that was done in 1978. Um, A few of the members of the band have been in The Outsiders, and then there was this kind of musical moment in the sort of late 70s, and then various members went on to form the sound, featuring the one and the only Adrian Borland as well as uh, Graham Bailey on bass. But anyway, we're going to find out much more about the band through this interview. So anyway, do check it out. The Crazies, the album is coming out. That's the main thing. A Simple Vision and uh, Optic Nerve Records from Preston are the people responsible. But anyway, look, after several minutes of uh, casual chat with Adrian, we got down to that very exciting subject that was the early formative years and also early influences. Adrian... Tell us everything. Tell us now. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess I'm a, I'm a few years older than yourself, so I would say um, the Dave Clark Five, uh, and um, I thought those those early singles of theirs, like Bits and Pieces, were were really powerful, actually. And um, you know, I, I've ended up drumming, and I kind of. You know, seeing Dave Clark sort of front and centre of the band, it was kind of, you know, you 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 sort of took from that that well, this guy's that is the the centre of it all. You know, nothing happens without him. So, uh, um, which you know, I, I've realised subsequently isn't necessarily the case. But I think I think you know, the drumming always impressed me on records from the start you know just instinctively and so i would i would go back to him and then a bit later on you've got um people like cream and uh hendrix and you know both great drummers with those bands um but then as you say i think um the sort of glam area because i i I liked um mark boland from way back like from the tyrannosaurus rex Days, right when he kind of re-emerged as t-rex you know but it took me a while till i realized the connection that you know this was the same guy who used to do these you know kind of little charming sort of folky songs was now you know rocking out and this was the same guy that i liked you know years before um so i think you know he he for a long time was the main main person I liked, um, Bowie, Roxy Music, um, who else, uh, the Stones and the Beatles, you know, yes. still very sort of key people. Um, my sister was uh, a bit of an influence on me. She was a massive Beatles fan, so I, I got exposed to a lot of that from, you know, quite a young age. Yes, and were your and were you was it a kind of a bit of a musical family or 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 were your parents not that bothered about the music kind of world? Um, they, no, they were no, they weren't really. Yeah, no, they weren't really bothered about it. Um, but I think uh, my 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 sisters and my brother, um, they 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 are all fans of different people, and I think I, even even if I even if I wasn't sort of listening to those people particularly, um, you know, just that. I, I suppose some families, um, you know, you're not um, exposed to much music or or the sense that music is a is an important part of life. Um, so with with them, the the people like uh, Dylan and mamas and the papas uh everly brothers people like that i've heard to some extent um so it wasn't i mean it's a musical family in so far as being kind of fans of different kinds of music but um only 
and then my dad was really a musician to any extent he played he played um uh, accordion and mandolin right that's quite handy isn't it because some some people go oh yes my dad was a jazz drummer and you know oh that must have helped or but then some people say my no my parents were complete Neanderthals, they hated music, they hated everything. I had to leave home when I was 13. <laughs> it was like, oh, people <laughs> yeah, didn't no, like It wasn't like that, but they weren't, you know, they they weren't kind of, they, ne- they never sort of pretended to sort of be cool and into the music that I liked. And I, I would probably have been a bit mortified if they had, you know. Yes, that would have. Why? Where could you rebel? So when did a yeah. drum kit, when did a drum kit enter into your life? Um, well, that, I think that was. I'm trying to think. Uh, I think I was really once we got the band going because um, what once uh, when we were about seventeen, eighteen, uh, that's when we first started playing some gigs. Um, but we'd been in some form. We'd been going this this was you know the real beginnings um we've just bought anything anything we could kind of rustle up so i, I was kind of uh oh, just odd sort of little plastic drums and cymbals that had somehow somehow accrued um so when when i first had a proper drum kit was um really as i say when we started playing gigs and then um so that was sort of late teens and then we um once we'd left school when we were 18 we um that's when we were trying to actually get somewhere mm. so uh had a, had a had a sort of proper kit then well it's basic it wasn't you know i think it was second hand it, it wasn't um uh you know ornate or anything but it, it sort of did the job so what was your first band you were in was this the outsiders well, uh, yeah, it, it, um, originally we were called Syndrome. This was right back in um, 1973. And that was with Adrian Borland's, he, you know, he was one of the originators. I came in a bit later. Um, and we called ourselves that for some time. Eventually we drafted in a, a Bob Lawrence guy called Bob Lawrence on bass, and then eventually that sort of settled into the nucleus of the three of us. Um, and it was again when we left school and we were sort of trying to get somewhere. We um, we thought, well, syndrome was a bit of a you know naff name, really. So that's that's when we hit upon the Outsiders, which which comes from the uh, Albert Camus book. But, not that I'd read it, but it just seemed like a good name. <laughs> yes, and there was, oh God, was there another one? I remember in the 80s, there was a film, The Outsiders, Francis Ford Coppola, based a, a, yeah. a, a film on a book, but um, Matt yeah. Dillon. Yes, so where were you, where was, where were you born, where was this kind of um, happening, by the way? I have no idea. Uh, in, in Surrey. Right. So did, did you and Adrian and then Bob, did you all sort of go to the same, were you all in the same neighbourhood and sort of knew each other? Well, we were in the same school. Um, so we were a bit, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we were a bit scattered uh, geographically, but we would, um, the, the thing was with, with Adrian Ball and his parents, I mean, sort of going back to one of your earlier questions, um, his parents were very encouraging of him and that you know as it became clear that he really had um a serious talent and serious uh, ambitions they they sort of uh, as far as they could they sort of pulled out all the stops for um for him and for the band so you know they bought him a guitar they bought him a microphone um you know they bought this this initial drum kit, you know, all this uh, kind of support. Yeah. Um, so we, we would gather at Adrian's house. That's where we would practice. And eventually his dad um, taught himself how to record. And um, we recorded at their house as well quite a, quite a lot. Right. God, he really did get encouraged, didn't he? And this is all the sort of 
early to mid 70s which was quite unusual at that stage because um because my parents were kind of very working class I mean we, there was no doubt there wasn't that many kind of options and opportunities and and luxury so obviously he was that quite a, was he quite a middle was that quite a middle class household that he came from um yeah but I mean it kind of um I mean it's a, it's a little later in time I don't know how much difference that makes um we we, we left school in uh 76 um yeah i mean i i would i would classify as as middle class but um you know he didn't have any um siblings so uh i think you know they weren't like uh, rich but you know insofar as they uh, had uh, you know reasonable standard of living you know they kind of invested a lot sort of literally and you know metaphorically in into adrian so yes. you know, they, they, they gave you know they gave him a lot of encouragement yes well yeah it's funny isn't it when when i was at school there was a, a few people who were just like sing, you know the only child and it was kind of yeah my brothers would just try and make me cry and kick a football at me a lot you know and, and sort of be nasty if i was just just wanted to be nasty. I was the youngest of three boys, you see. So um oh, yes, right. I, I didn't get too much kind of like, you know, if I cried they would just kind of make it even worse by teasing me. So um yes, that's life. That's that's the that's the wonderful world of families, isn't it? But uh, they were okay. Don't worry, I'm not emotionally scarred by that. But then right. yes, so <laughs> so then you got the outsiders. God, that was mm. quite, you were a very angsty band if you were already going for the commute commute sort of um you know. Well, uh I mean, like I say, I only read it later on, but I think, yeah, we we had that. That was the, that was the thing with writing your own songs, being able to express yourself. That um, you know, we even, even from the start, we never really, I don't know, we just never really even considered um, covering other people's songs. Um, it, it was a lot of the satisfaction of being a band was writing our own stuff and then coming up with our own ideas and you know we 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 always pursued that as a as a path and you know whether the emotions were as you say angsty or or whatever we were um you know it was a real outlet for us so um you know if some people uh, found uh, some support or or comfort or whatever in in listening to us, then um, you know all well and good. Yes, because because you brought two albums out in seventy seven yeah. and seventy eight, which was Calling on Youth and and Close Up, and this was on the Raw Edge Records. Is I'm assuming this is your own label that you decided to set up as well. Yeah, well, you know, again, that's another or perhaps the um, the key. Uh, a bit of support of the of uh, Adrian's parents that they um, you know they put enough money into us to uh, make a um, you know limited edition of of, of albums and uh, you know paid paid for the, uh, the recording sessions. Um, well, the, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, with with calling on youth that was done at the house at their house. Right. Um, it's, it's only the second album that we did in a professional studio. So that that was when they paid for the session there. Yes, amazing. And that, bizarrely, came out on Cherry Red Records this year, didn't it? A compilation of your material, which was called Count for Something. Uh, yeah, well, the reason um, or the connection with Cherry Red, we they actually put out our two... Um, like official albums that you mentioned, um, they made CD uh, releases of them in 2012. It was, um, but what happened uh, in the in, in the meantime was that uh, Bob Borland uh, died, and when it came to sorting out the um, belongings in the house, I asked the um i asked the executors uh to you know if they could pass on any 
outsiders material that they came across so they were they were quite content to do that um, and what I found um, amongst all this material the all these you know real to real tapes um, were not just the um, not just the masters of of the albums that you've mentioned but um, a whole lot of other stuff so um, because Cherry Red had shown some interest years before I thought well I'll try them you know for well there was one particular recording of the one live recording we ever did of ourselves on a cassette and um, so I asked uh, I asked them if they'd be interested in bringing that out and the the guy at Cherry Red uh, whose um, name's John Reed he's the the head of the catalogue but he sort of came back and said well you know have you apart from this cassette have you got any other material and um, you know it sort of mushroomed into this whole concept of oh well we could do a whole <coughs> a whole box set which was you know way beyond anything I'd conceive but that was you know that's that was the seed of, of uh, you know that live cassette was the seed of it and then this additional material was from amongst these other tapes that I kind of inherited. My God. Well, did you say that was all from Bob Lawrence's kind of archive or? No, Bob Borland. Sorry, there's a lot of Bobs involved. God yeah, but <laughs> Adrian's dad is called Bob as well as our bassist. Oh, of course. Right, Borland. Right, Bob Borland, not yeah. Bob Lawrence. Yeah. Sorry, Bob Lawrence is still with us. Okay, that's good. Oh, yes, very much so. Thank you. But you recorded close up at the famous. Um, studio which we we all love in Cambridge didn't you this was um the one the space ward one with Bob yeah. and with Gary Lucas which um yeah. funny enough I did an interview with the guy who ran it called Mike um recently because a lot of people a lot of people love this kind of studio and they mention it as being very important even people I've done a few interviews with people in America and they they they're obviously very geeky you know musicians even though they're quite I don't know but anyway, they were just saying they just anything that comes from that studio, they try and listen and buy because they love the quality. So obviously, um, yes. That, so what was your experience, just you know, briefly at that that place? Um, well, I think my my main my main recollection is that um, uh, well, we we I wouldn't say we exactly we had run-ins with. Gary Lucas, but um, we were still we were still very much coming from a kind of semi-punk kind of philosophy, if you like. Uh, that you know, so you don't um, you don't sort of have lots of uh, effects, or um, you know, you you go for a pretty straightforward sound. And he was he was saying to us. Well, you know, in effect, well, I think you're not you're not differentiating your songs enough. Whereas to us, that was well, that's our style. You know, yes. so we're, we're trying to establish a style. So that's that's why songs have sounds uh, have similar uh, characteristics. Um, anyway, I mean, it kind of it, it worked out in the end. But I, I have yeah, I have seen some stuff on the internet about space ward myself i i haven't i didn't realize that it had become um you know a bit of a thing you know cult status got... they they just yeah. love it now a cult yeah. status thing yeah anyway yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but he uh, i think someone told me did he not he died a few years ago is that right gary lucas i'm not sure about gary mike's definitely alive i hope so guys yeah. <laughs> unless something's yeah, happened in the last two months i think, I think someone Someone told me that a while back, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, th the thing was maybe we weren't. I mean, to us, the songs did, you know, were different from one another. You know, we could hear the difference, um, but uh, you know, I, I mean, it wasn't like we had sort of stand up rows or anything. But I, th I, I do remember that bit of uh, friction in our. Yeah. Um, sort of viewpoints about what we were what we were going for probably a few um, 
a few years on, you would have probably just punched the guy and got drunk and smashed the place up. But um, that would have yeah. been when you developed a probably a drug habit as well. So luckily that didn't happen. But then you yeah. know, so when the, the band finished, the the Outsiders, is this when the next combo you know appears? The Crazies. This is the this is the moment, isn't it? Um. Well, it's kind of. Hmm. Yeah, it's not quite as cut and dried as that. I know, it just wouldn't be, would it? it just... No, no not, not with that, no. Um, <laughs> what, what happened was, um, towards the end of 1978, and that's, you know, we had done our kind of official Outsiders uh, albums by that point, so it was a bit later in the year. Um, there was this you know our, our, one of the main things that drew us together as a friendship group at this uh pub in Wimbledon was you know all being you know music fanatics and one of these uh people who was our good friend of ours was a guy called Pete Williams and um one of the one of the things one of the sort of symptoms of this enthusiasm for music was some of the time particularly he and adrian would would uh, sort of dream up um fantasy bands so it you know not um and then think of you know what would their songs be and what they sound like you know develop a whole kind of uh concept of them anyway pete um was eventually sort of came up with the idea that well he'd actually would really like to do one of these um concept bands kind of thing um and everything i think it was it was still regarded as his fantasy except he then um you know he did then roll up with a bunch of lyrics and say i'm, I'm i've got a studio booked and um well, I personally, I kind of just got invited along um, by Adrian. You know, he just said we've got this session at the weekend, and I didn't really know what to expect, but um, just kind of, kind of went along with it because um, it just sounded like fun to do. Um, mm -hmm. So the crazies was really, I would say, Pete and Adrian's uh, baby, so to speak. And um, the rest was just turned up because it, you know, seemed like it might be um, a laugh to do. Right. So just to try and understand this, 78 Pete Williams was in a band or had the band Honolulu Mountain Daffodils. God knows. Just imagine the names that got. Is that true? Uh, not at that time. No, this is this uh, Honolulu's is about 10 years later. Um so the the crazies is the first thing that he ever did in a studio. That was that was part of the thing that was so um, kind of amazing of it because you know he he doesn't really um, he doesn't really show any inhibitions in his in his singing. Um, but as far as you know, that's the first time that he he'd been in a studio, and we were just kind of letting rip alongside him. But the Honolulu's is about 10 years later and that's that's much more him and adrian and a couple of other other you know other friends who got involved with that right well and he calls himself what lord Zilarko. Zilarko. <laughs> my god <laughs> i think that's uh, as if if memory serves they because he was um he was a big crystal palace fan and there used to be this guy played or Crystal Palace called John Sulaco. Right. I think, I think it was I think it was a homage to him. Yeah. Most people would have gone for Stanley Bowles or or Bowles, yeah. really. That was the main man, but not Sulaco. Anyway, look, there you go. So then the Crazies, which is this kind of album that's come out on Opting Nerve, that features Pete, Adrian, right. yourself, Graham, and then B. B. B, yeah. right. So this is kind of a, a recording that happened in a very short period of time. Yeah, it was um, literally one day and then a bit later. This was December 78 that we did this. One day uh, that we did the recording and then um, I think 
just on just before the end of the year we went back for the for the mixing session and that that was it and then um we had a few cassettes made of it um which i think basically everyone who was involved had a copy mm -hmm. um and then you know it just sort of languished for um and, until you know 2020 when i asked cherry red if they'd be interested in in bringing this you know bringing out this recording as well as the outsiders and they said no uh well no no they were more, more positive than that um but they they not as an official cherry red thing because the thing the their their reasoning as i understand it was the outsiders although we weren't you know had only sort of very limited success when we were going you know we, um we still had some kind of there was still the sense that um people would vaguely remember the name but right. the crazy had absolutely no um no history you know so um Is so they, felt, they have a bit of history don't you but no i guess yeah yeah, but, there are, but, but there only are seven tracks. I guess that's a bit of a stumbling yeah. point, isn't it? But this was all recorded in one day at Elephant Studios. So with, with the, engineered by Nick Robbins. So did hmm. you go in, did, did Pete have the songs and you just kind of had to jam along with them in a slightly frenetic, late teen kind of excitable way? Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, we... Um, I'm, I don't, you know, I don't know if there was any sort of real discussion between uh, Pete and Adrian beforehand, but, um, you know, for the rest of us, it was definitely a thing of on the day that we just, um, it, it, I mean, just, it, it literally does sound crazy to say it now, but we just um, sort of said, right, this is number one, you know, did a run through, then sort of got an idea of what we were doing, then, okay, record it. That was then, you know, that was the next step. Okay, that's done. Right, now it's time for to check uh, song number two. Let's do that. And mm -hmm. we would, you know, we just do one one through, you know, make that up on the spot uh, just to get our bearings sort of thing and then um, record it and then go on to the next one and it you know so we actually sort of went through so quickly at, at that rate that um i think actually uh he only had the six songs so we the rest of us had a break and went off to get something to eat and he um he came up with some more lyrics and in the meantime we came back and we recorded another song was that the one when we are dead? That's right. Yeah. yeah oh, right. So. Well, so was was there a kind of a, an element of creative genius and youthful excitement in the air? Oh, I I think so. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the fact of um, well, I mean, genius, I guess, is for other people to say, but just the thing of um, being excited in in doing something and attempting something um musically uh, we were you know we were kind of always up for that and just um you know we we were you know pretty constantly writing songs uh, and you know feel, feeling like we were developing so yes. um you know, I, I think, yeah, any chance we got to do like a recording um, or uh, play a gig, we would take because it was, you know, it's just uh, uh, part of the, you know, real focus of being in a band and the, you know, excitement of, of, uh, of creating something. Yeah, well, absolutely. Did um, I mean, so with the, well, you've done the recording, and it sort of you do the cassettes. Then where does the kind of the the master tape or some of the you know the evidence sit for the next forty three years? Uh, well, basically, I think in Bob Holland's 
else. Right. So um, Bob, Bob's, Bob had the archive. Had you slightly yeah. forgot about this? Oh, no, you'd have had a cassette, wouldn't you? And went, mm, yes. Yeah, I had, I had the cassette. And I, I mean, this, I, I don't feel like I'm expressing myself as, as well as I might. But basically, um, you know, with the crazies particularly, you know, there's absolutely no kind of real um, ambition with it. It was just, you know, this sounds like, this will be good fun to do. Yes. Let's do it. Not, you know, no sort of sense of, of obviously there was no internet then anyway, but no sort of sense of, oh, well, let's broadcast this to the world and, you know, try and sell thousands and thousands of copies. It was just something we did at a weekend. It was, it was good fun. But speaking for myself over the years, um, you know, I I never sort of I never sort of fell out of love with the cassette, and um, you know, every so often I would kind of think, well, this would this would be great to be, you know, an actual record. Um, and B's husband at one point made a ran off a CD of it for me, so that was you know that sounded a bit better quality then as well. But even then, that was that was years ago, um, and then this opportunity with having uh, having received these various master tapes, including the crazies, that was the point at which um, you know the, the, the thought of well, maybe this is the time to bring it out if we can. So I had to. Um, I had to clip, kind of clear it with B and Graham, who were the only other um, surviving members of the band, because, um, as I expect you know, unfortunately, both Pete and Adrian Borlander, you know, uh, uh, passed on. So, yes. um, but they were they were amenable. So, um, Cherry Red were to the extent of they said, "Well, we'll." We'll find a label to put it out. We don't want to put it out as a cherry cherry red thing as such, but we can find um, a label that we're associated with to to bring out. I, I think they feel it was less of a you know commercial risk for them to to do it that way. But you know we were just happy to um, to have it finally you know. Uh, turned into a tangible yes so were they, are they connected then to optic nerve records in preston well i think there's um i think there's an association uh, you know that they kind of like license material to them to bring it right. out i've got you yes because I, 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 I don't think they're a subsidiary as such no. but it's you know that they they can they can bring some, uh, I suppose, uh, distribution power to bear, for instance, and publicity. You know, oh, that that's kind. good. That's amazing. Because B's done the the uh, the artwork for the album as well. So is that oh, was yeah. that was that done quite recently? You know, as in that was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She did that uh, in you know the past few months. So we, she was sending different versions to Graham and myself and um, uh, you know eventually we um, the consensus was for uh, for the um, amazing creation she came up with yes well, I know you don't you don't want design by committee that's a disaster do you? <laughs> so, yeah. you know oh, could you just do something no I can't um yeah oh that's fantastic so it's come out on vinyl records uh, vinyl, yeah. vinyl record no just a vinyl record and um yeah so do they is it about how many do they get printed of these or pressed up if they can find a printing plant for vinyl now um oh I, I don't know off the top of my head what the yes what, the uh, quantity um, is, um, I, you know, I wouldn't think it's more than uh, a couple of thousand, something of that order, yeah. and then then it's a matter of sort of seeing how it how it goes. Um, I mean, in I, know, I do remember in the outsiders' days, we usually, I think, we went for a kind of pressing of a thousand. 
Um, so, you know, I think it's it's a lowish figure, but then it's, you know, kind of testing the water at the moment. Um, yeah. And also, I think people have become very fascinated with this kind of period and also, you know, having a little bit more easy access by a cherry red and all those other labels and optic nerve. I think they've they've built a brand which people are very, you know, become kind of well known around the world because people just yes know that um, these people, <laughs> these strange people who run these labels, not cherry red because that's more of a you know organisation, but the one you know like Fire Station and uh, Clydebury and and Ian in Preston, you know, it's mm. like well they're they're kind of fans who are just kind of enjoying it and they're going to put out things that they like right. so it's, yeah. it's not going to be something peculiar well rubbish so there yeah. you go so then yeah. so you, you do this and that's come out which is brilliant and then what happens to you with because obviously the outsiders has finished this is kind of a one-off um yeah. project then what what happens to you next uh musically me, yeah did you go into another band after this the sound no, no. Um, what happened there? I mean, we we really um, we need Pete Frame uh, involved in this, don't we? Do? We need me. We do need, get, we need get, a diagram. Get, we need more. Yeah, we need get, 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 little get, figures get, being yeah. moved around the spreadsheet. Um, what happened with the sound was um, over over the following year to when we'd done the crazies. Um, I, I came to the decision to, you know, we weren't making uh, that much progress as the outsiders and it's, a, you know, it's kind of a wrench, but I, I decided uh, I, w I would leave. Um, so Adrian and Graham were carrying on and B had become more and more part of the band. So you had, you had the three of them in place yeah. and the person, um, who was managing us by that point? He knew a drummer uh, who was Mike Dudley in a in a band, or who had been in several bands, I think. Um, so he 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 came into position um, in the course of 1979 to replace me. Um, they still were calling themselves the Outsiders for quite a lot of 1979, and then um, at some point they decided well it's in a lot of ways it's a new band so we'll come up with a new name so that's how you end up with the sound right so it's kind of I still I, I mean they were still sort of very good friends of mine and I did um, I did continue to contribute a few lyrics um, for the sound um, in the you know uh, sort of the next few years um so there was there was a kind of maintaining of the connection yes in, in the as well so was this the point then you you know the music as a career or some as as a well, you know as a sort of full time or very much a kind of a kind of a focus in the life did you sort of put that to one side and then get on with the yeah. rest of your life yeah i um I uh, went to university and um, I mean, I've, you know, obviously kept, uh, you know, music as a big enthusiasm in life, but um, now I um, uh, eventually sort of got into a career of uh, librarianship. But, um, My God. There you go. I mean, probably that's the most sensible move you ever made, really, because having done <laughs> having done this show for so long, I mean, God, you know, bloody hell. The other night I did an interview with the guitarist from Twisted Sister. I mean, <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, it's like started in 72 and, you know, the, um, yes, amazing amount of ups and downs and mm -hmm. bankruptcies after you've, you know, sold billions of records. And you just think, God, how did your brain cope? And um, yes, who knows? So, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he, the sound were a decidedly more successful band than uh, the Outsiders ever were, and the, I mean, the Crazies, as I say, we didn't really have aspirations for the Crazies in, in any case, um, but he, even at the sort of level the sound got to, um, unfortunately it ended up with, you know, various kind of 
uh, arguments and um, disputes that I mean I'm not really um, I, you know, I only know of in very sort of broad terms but you kind of you see how things turned out with a band like say the Smiths um, you know and then it's sort of even at a quite lower level um, you know happening to your own friends which um, quite quite uh, sad to see really yeah you know, no going, it, it's it's going a... to music with such enthusiasm and then it's all, all this all this crap happens that is not you know what you're interested in at all i know it's um it often takes about 30 years for some members of the band i mean i'm not talking about the smiths that's a whole other subject isn't it yeah. but um you know with a lot of bands you know, they had that kind of moment, because I suppose having done this show for quite a while, you know, there's a five year narrative, you know, you get together as friends in the same community, you know, you, you sort of have a year honeymoon sort of doing music. And then in the 80s, you know, there was the great John Peel. So if you got the single and the John Peel play and then you got the John Peel session, things are going good. First album, things are kind of going quite well. Um, and there's a bit more touring in the van. And then the second album. And then by then, you know, they, those kind of conversations you didn't realise you should have had at the beginning kind of start to sort of emerge. And I think, the, the, the la well, there's two things. There's a sort of lack of money and then there's a sort of the struggle and the dynamics and, and everything else that went for it. So it's not really... Um, it's not for the faint-hearted. I think that's the thing, isn't it, really? Mm, yeah, yeah. And as I say, I think, you know, you, you, you go into music with a, you know, quite a, a pure enthusiasm. Um, and there's a whole lot of uh, problems and um, uh, emotional ups and downs that, you, you know, you don't anticipate when it's uh, when you're starting out you know you just ask, you know, aspire to something uh, really positive and it, it's it's not as simple as that unfortunately but you must be really pleased to have seen the work that you did over 40 years ago sort of get so nicely catalogued and to, and to be so sort of kind oh, of remembered it you know yeah i mean that's 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 really uh mm. Yeah, that's really remarkable to me. And um, but uh, I mean, that, as I say, uh, obviously, we didn't have the internet in the days when the outsides were going. But um, I have taken quite a lot of um, solace from looking at uh, things that people have out uploaded of ours to YouTube, for instance. And then you kind of see, for instance, um, you know, some really positive comment about something you recorded in the late seventies, and they so someone's made a comment about it about you know six months ago, you know, literally. So I mean that that's just wonderful to me. Um, you know, something it does feel sort of uh, a bit of kind of vindication or. Uh, you know something of that sort that well you know maybe we were actually not <laughs> not not as bad as people or you know some people were saying and you know maybe uh maybe if we'd been able to push a bit harder we'd have got uh yes got an audience so yeah no i mean i'm 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 uh i'm, I'm really delighted and and thrilled that uh the crazies have come out and the uh outsiders box set you know, I think um, that's, uh, it, it, that, you know, it does make it feel worthwhile. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's fantastic. And um, and it's also, it must, I say I must, I'm just kind of loaded there. Um, you know, being able to sort of slightly communicate again with Graham and B, you know, on a project rather than just kind of saying happy Christmas, but actually going through with these kind of little bits and pieces. Mm. Must yeah. kind of you know because you need to have a purpose to sort of get in touch with someone again normally, rather than just going hello yeah. how are you and they go what yeah. do you want yeah I, I, yeah I think um, uh, you know I, I think we we really tried to um, approach things as as democratically as we as we could particularly given that we're you know separated by. Uh, uh, well, separated by an ocean from Graham. Um, 
So I, 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 I did get the sense from all our communications that they, they felt, you know, very, very happy that, um, you know, we've really tried to do things in, um, you know, the right way, if you like. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was good um, having that purpose because uh, I mean, I, I, I would certainly say that, you know, with the whole, because uh, most of the work went on um, during 2020 and then into the early part of this year. So, I mean, for me, there was a lot of, um, you know, gave me a lot of uh, direction in the whole lockdown. Yes. Nightmare. So, yeah, um, absolutely. That must be quite. And uh, did you, and were you quite alive, but had you played quite a lot of live gigs as the outsiders? Um, not, I wouldn't say a lot, you know, we, we didn't have, we weren't playing that frequently. Um, not, not because we, you know, didn't want to, it was just hard to, to get gigs, but, um, I think all told while I was with the band, we probably pay, played up to about, oh, say about 60 or so gigs from, from 1976 to 1979. Right. So, yeah. You know, it's not, we, uh, there was only one thing that um, counted as, you know, even something approaching a, a mini tour, which was something we did in 1979. Um, but uh, I think, I think we kind of, I mean, I, Adrian, said himself at one point that um, for him the outsiders was a kind of uh, apprenticeship so um, you know, even though there weren't that many gigs that we played it was still enough to have given him quite a, a good uh, amount of experience of being a performer so that you know when he moved on to the next stage with the sound he was you know, he was quite sort of comfortable in that role and really, yeah. you know, really took it on. And, you know, they just, uh, you know, came up with some really, really good songs. So, you know, you have the combination there. That, so that's kind of a, a, you know, real sort of formula for, for live success. Yeah, absolutely. No, you, it's important to get an out live. I mean, yes, yeah. absolutely. And when was the last time you saw... Adrian and, and Pete, had you, had you kept in touch with them or seen them much, you know, after that period and then everyone going oh, separate? Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it was more sporadic as the years um, as went on because people obviously uh, went, went their separate ways to some extent. Um, every, <clears throat> excuse me, every so often I'd come back to, uh, to Surrey or to Wimbledon and uh, see some of the kind of old crowd um, but um, a lot of the time in the 90s um, Adrian um, actually spent living abroad because he um, he did have more of a kind of cult following in places like Holland yeah uh, so you know he he, uh, he wasn't in the country nearly so much but yeah, I still um, I still saw him from time to time, particularly because by that time he was playing uh, solo gigs, um, and you know they were very sort of few and far between. But usually, if if I could get to one of them, I would do so. Yes. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's. That some must have been sometime in the year before he died. There was a gig he played in in London at the Borderline. That's the last last time I actually remember seeing him play. And as for as for Pete, Pete died some years later. But um, pardon, he became more of a uh, I think kind of recluse as the years went on and. Uh, I, I think, you know, he kind of withdrew, really. He, he, 
he was uh, he, he was ill with uh, alcoholism, and, uh, you know that. Uh, I, you know, I hadn't seen him for for quite a few years when I I got the bad news that he uh, died as well. Mm. But um, you know, I, I mean, that is another that is another motivation, definitely for for doing you know you know getting the crazies actually out to the the wider world to to hear that um, you know they were two very sort of funny and talented people and um, you know it's just uh, another another example of this you know that as I said later on they combined and did this other band the Honolulu Mountain Daffodils uh, but that was um, you know sort of late 80s early 90s so you you're at least a, a decade on from the from the crazies so by yes. then they're kind of um, you know, using a lot of samples and you know, using the what was new technology then to uh, to make the music a lot of the time. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and did so just briefly, did you keep your drum kit and occasionally sort of would have a a drum or even occasionally join a band and and have a few moments? Or did it sort of pretty much sort of finish there with you for you? Yeah, no, I I, uh, I left it with. Um, I left it with the band that um, Mike Dudley, who, as I say, uh, replaced me. He he um, he already had his own kit. Um, I think um, I think it got sold off eventually. But I, w- I was in no position to um, I was in no position to uh, play it. Um, you know, not my sort of living I'm like in bed sits and stuff. Yes. I wasn't in any circumstances to uh, really play a kit and annoy the neighbours. <laughs> so, yes. uh, so, but I mean, I've, I've kind of come back to playing the last few years because there was a, a tribute gig for what would have been Adrian's 60th birthday a few years ago, and out of that. We, um, the friends I got involved with there, we we started um, this band Moon Underwater, which um, we're uh, you know now pursuing in a sort of fitful way. But uh, we we um, we're uh, we you know we've got some proper gear and we're um, we've got a an EP planned. For oh, brilliant! Oh, my God. oh yeah. That, that, that should be coming out in a few weeks' time. Moon and the water. I'll check it out. That's great. Well, that's that's always nice to know, actually, isn't it? Everyone, well, you get to an age where everything's a bit fit for, really. I mean, all these yeah. bands from the, the 80s, they sort of, you know, they have a little go, but they don't want to sort of give up the day job or to, you know, their routine or whatever they're doing too much for the sort of going back into music. But I think they quite enjoy it, so... Yes, just as a, an organic, happy experience, really. That's the thing, isn't it? That's what I mean. Yeah, if you could have said something to your, say, like sixteen-year-old self, you know, who was just kind of where you were the back then. What is there anything you would have just kind of whispered in their ears as you were sitting behind the kit? Um, oh. Uh, No, I, I think I think I'd have kept my counsel. I think I think the sixteen-year-old me would have been um, a bit disappointed to have uh, have this version um, telling him all the you know cynical uh, things I've realised since then. I, I I think I'd rather be kept his innocence. Yes, I think that that could that's often the way, isn't it? Really, otherwise you just like, you know most people when I ask that guy. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would never. I, no, I would never have said that to him because that, that that was that was a very um, that was a very important outlet for me for a, a long time. And uh, you know, I've got not only the the songs, but you know, some really good friendships out of it. So no, I mean, the the balance is definitely towards the positive, but. You know, I I do realise 
um, or have realized that there are uh, negative aspects as, as well since then. It's not all, um, you know, uh, sitting around in your mansion as, as the, as the uh, royalties roll in. Yes, I know. I was listening to an interview with Suzanne Vega and, and you know, people would like see her getting off a bus or getting out of a taxi. Going, well, I thought you'd have a show for it. It's like, I can't, people have no idea, do they? You know, it's like, you know, even yeah. if you sell millions of copies of albums, you know, you still end up, you know, yeah, you know, if you if you keep in the music kind of world, you know, okay, you might have that moment of kind of like, wow, I'm kind of become this big star. But, you know, if you keep in it, you're not going to keep there. You're going to go back to another level, which is quite a lot less than that. And um, you have to you have to navigate that. So it's not as it's not an easy as everyone says, it's not a particularly easy gig and career. So and then you realize it's probably not much of a career. But, you know, the formative years, I mean, most people, you know, when they say, no, don't do it. They say, well, I wouldn't really say that. But, you know, you just realize that, yeah, there's a, there's a point and a bit like what you probably did, where you think actually it's probably best to get out now while I'm still walking and talking in a vaguely straight line. It's good. Mm. I haven't got yeah. too bitter. You know, that's the, that's the main thing. But the brilliant thing is, you know, like in the last you know, 48 months, you've just brought out all this stuff from over four decades ago, which is, is quite unreal, actually. Yeah, have, have you had a chance to hear the crazies? Yes, I've got. Yeah, I got the. Um, I got sent the MP3s, and I've been listening to them. So it's pretty wild and and exciting. It was really in, interesting, sort of working out. You know, I I sort of realised where when it was made, but then at the same time, it didn't sound like it was that period. If you know what I mean. Well, that's yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's that's interesting to hear because I mean, I kind of. Um, I think from the perspective of now, um, I can hear more clearly that uh, you know the Stooges feed into it quite a lot. But it also reminds me of people like um, uh, Jesus and Mary Chain in Sonic Youth, who um, we just obviously could not have heard at that point. So. Um, because you know it's several years before they even existed so yeah um, quite yeah I mean I think that's the interesting thing because because that period there was a lot of dreadful punk albums and bands appearing and and it didn't go for that sort of sound at all did it really you know it was it was no no I mean uh, we, we, we really just kind of let loose and sort of you know uh, what's that saying um you know uh, cast the chips and let them fall where they yeah. may that's, that's what we sort of tried to do musically really I think that's fantastic I just I just you know personally I, I I've become a bit of obsessive about archive and stuff as well so I think it's great that all these things get out and about will it so it's come out on vinyl is it is it is there cd and downloads and all that kind of stuff coming out with it as well um yeah there's Sorry, there's something appeared on the screen about iCloud. I'm trying to get this off so I can see you again. <laughs> Your iCloud is full. Oh, I don't know. Uh, right. Um, yeah, the cherry. Yeah, cherry red have got the um, the digital rights. So yes, it, you can download the um, tracks if if uh, if you want to do it that way um there's no i did ask about this quite recently actually because someone asked me um there's no plans at the moment to make a an actual official cd release so it is it is either vinyl or download oh, fantastic moment. so that means you know in that optimistic way you might get a royalty check in eight, two years time for 50 pounds oh, well you, you, you know <laughs> but, uh, at least yeah um <laughs> no, I, I don't know i mean that's one of the things i'm really interested and in, uh excited about with it just to see because i think depending on obviously how many people hear it um i think it's going to kind of surprise quite a lot of people who have got uh preconceptions about uh either adrian or the outsiders um you know, to 
to hear what what we did in, in on this album. So, um, you know, if, if it turns out to be, um, you know, some incredible uh, mega hit, then all well and good. But I, I'm just, as I say, I'm just really pleased to uh, see it realised as a as a tangible object. Yes, no, it's brilliant. It's really good, and it's so confusing with the band, isn't it? Because a lot of Adrians and Bobs, so um, you know, the <laughs> yeah. <movies>, so <laughs> yeah. I think I think we're the only only band that ever had two Adrians in. So that's... I think that yeah, I was thinking they're probably Adrian yeah. Sherwood, isn't there on, on New Sound? But there's not many Adrians who you know in the world of rock. Oh. Yeah. So anyway, you have got two, so that's that's brilliant. But look, Adrian. <laughs> Thank you ever so much for this. This has been amazing. And that was me in conversation with Adrian James, drummer with The Crazies and also The Outsiders. So you can, yes, The Outsiders, that compilation, and he's probably mentioned that in the interview, has come out on Cherry Red Records. I do believe it's something like five CD box set with lots of other bits and pieces. Probably an amazing booklet. But uh, yes, do check that out. This has been... Like I said, David Eastall, if you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, do you see 86 show, keep it positive and groovy, life's too short. And um, yes, all these have been archived. You can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean. Have a great week. Stay safe.